the signal is there all the time, but we need a TV set to access it. I think that's what the, what the brain is doing. And therefore, once you accept that, that the consciousness is the essence and that the material form is simply um, a, a kind of suit or an avatar into which consciousness is situated, then you become open to the notion that consciousness must, of course, survive death. And you understand out-of-body experiences because consciousness is not dependent on the body. It is simply immersed in the body for a particular period of time. Consciousness, I believe, is eternal. I think it's one of the forces of the universe, um, like gravity, uh, and, and it's been with us forever, and it's what the whole universe is about, actually. Graham, what's your theory on how they moved those huge blocks of pyramid stone? Well, um, some of the... We mustn't underestimate the abilities of ancient cultures who've been working with stone for thousands of years to, to do things with stone that, that we can't do. But really, some of their feats go beyond the, the, the physical and, and require us to consider. Um, and, and indeed, if you look into the ancient Egyptian myths, some kind of mind control, a, a, a science that harnessed the power of the human mind to move large objects uh, independent of physical leverage. There are beams above the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid, already 300 feet above the ground, which weigh 70 tons each and are made of solid granite. These things are, are, are vast. They're, they're sort of room-sized beams. And, and uh, it absolutely beggars belief as to how they were got into place simply using humans pulling ropes. It just, you know, it, it, anybody who's actually seen those beams ca cannot believe <coughs> that it was done simply by mechanical advantage, that they knew something that we didn't know. And there are myths that speak of the priests singing these huge blocks uh, into place. And we have stories amongst the Tibetans of song, of sound being used to lift uh, blocks of stone. I, I, I think that there's a technology of consciousness that was used in the past to manipulate the physical world, which we've forgotten today. Next up, we go to Colton, California. Hello, Joe. You're up with us on Coast to Coast. Hey, Mr. Norman Graham, how are you guys doing? All good, right, good to have you with us. Fine, thank you. I had a real quick question. I just want to know exactly what is the Ark of the Covenant really? I just want to know like what is its purpose. And like, I heard about it on Indiana Jones, and um, cause you guys made a quick reference to it. But I just want to know like what kind of part it has, or, or what what's the significance, or what what exactly is the Ark? Well, in the Bible, it is the um, it, it, it is the home of God on earth. It is the interface between the deity and human beings. Yep. It's why the first temple is built in Jerusalem. Um, David is considered not pure enough to build it, but his son Solomon is, and he builds the temple, and it is built exclusively as an house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Wasn't it the depository of the uh, Ten Commandments? And, and the Bible tells us that it was the depository of the Ten uh, Commandments. And yet, when you look at the properties of these, stones on which the Ten Commandments were supposedly inscribed by the finger of God, uh, you find that a radiance emerges from them, that it, that it burns the face of Moses, that it can cause blindness, that it, that it contains a, a power um, that, that uh, energizes the ark, uh, almost like a, like a power plant. It's a very, very, very strange. When you simply look at the ancient accounts and take them on their own terms, you find that you're dealing with something that has a spiritual function and also, weirdly, a technological function. Didn't someone, or didn't they say in the Bible that if you, you know, if you touched it the wrong way, you could get electrocuted or you could die? They... Absolutely. There's the story of Uzzah. Um, who is um, uh, in the throng surrounding the ark as David is having it carried up. It's carried on special poles, which are wood covered in gold, which is a very strong insulating property, by a group of priests, the Levites, who are specially skilled in transporting the ark. It's always wrapped in hides, in animal skins, to prevent, uh, to prevent its radiance from damaging the crowd. And in this case, the ark is on the back of a cart, and it's seen, it's seen to be toppling slightly and this individual comes out of the crowd Uzzah and he reaches up his hand to steady it and as he does so a bolt of lightning comes out from the ark and strikes him dead he's fried and killed instantly on the spot and actually there's many accounts in the Bible uh, of the ark doing this when the Philistines grab the ark uh, and take it away from the Israelites for a while after about three weeks they give it back because it's, uh, it's caused amongst them a, a terrible outbreak of cancerous tumors well what is that remind us of, you know? Yeah, I I exactly. Fascinating, Graham. 
Fascinating work. Let's go to Caesar in San Francisco, California. Hi, Caesar. Hello, gentlemen. Um, nice, thank you for taking my call. Sure thing. Mr. Hancock, yeah. you may have single-handedly explained addiction in the, on this planet. Um, the suppression of expressing consciousness, I feel that um, the uh, politics and religion of this world have um, – have made it possible for us not explore our consciousness, which is why people look to substance abuse and things like that to yes. to, ex- to explore their, uh, a different consciousness and a different way of thinking. Yes, abs- abs- and, abs- absolutely. Yeah. And uh, sorry, I hello, him. hello, I bumped him. Well, well, just to pick up on that, on on the point hold it, that Graham, you're... until we come back. Okay. Okay. We'll okay. be back. We're going out into space tomorrow on our next Coast to Coast program with Robert Zimmerman, The Universe in a Mirror. When we come back, we'll take final phone calls with Graham Hancock on Coast to Coast AM. Nice job tonight, by the way, Graham. Very informative. Thank you, George. Thank you. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, The last caller before the break was talking about the higher states of consciousness. Yes. And, you know, the difference, I think, between getting into that with, uh, as we've talked about, the altered states of uh, of drugs and mm-hmm. not. Mm-hmm. Uh, how can people at will do it without drugs? Well, there, there are many techniques which have been developed by shamanistic cultures uh, all over the world that allow us to enter altered states of consciousness with, without using drugs uh, very, very effectively. And the, the, these, these include rhythmic drumming, certain kinds of music, certain kinds of dance. I wouldn't rule out hypnosis as, uh, as a technique for entering altered states of consciousness. Of course, we all enter an altered state of consciousness every night when we fall asleep. We should not ignore our dreams. In modern society, it's an insult to call somebody a dreamer because we so love the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness. But in ancient times, dreams were regarded as a, a valid way of knowing and, and uh, that it was recognized that valid and useful information uh, came to us through dreams. Uh, but it's the case that, that the greater majority of shamanistic cultures around the world do use the visionary plants that have evolved alongside us as their allies uh, in entering altered states of consciousness uh, at, at, at will. And, and again, the puritanical streak in Western society tends to regard this as somehow wrong, although if we think it through and realize that brain chemistry is involved in every experience, we have, I think we would discover that we're, that we're being illogical. But somehow it seems too easy, you know, to consume certain visionary plants. And, and, and it just seems we, we kind of feel from the puritanical background that, we, that Western cultures come from, we kind of feel that, you know, there should be agonizing work and, and pain in order to, to achieve these visionary states. And it seems somehow wrong that they can be achieved quickly using plants. But, of course, the real important thing is what you do with the visionary state afterwards. I mean, I, my, my view is, you know, why, 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 why walk 500 miles when you can take the train? The point is the destination that you get to and what you then do with the information that you get at that destination. And the process of, of integrating and acting upon uh, visionary experiences, that's where the real hard work begins, where the individual is shown a different side of reality, perhaps is, is given information about himself or herself that, that is really important in adjusting their behavior. That's when the real work begins. It becomes with what we do with the visions. Um, and therefore, I, I'm in favor of, of making it um, easier and more direct for people to attain the visionary state and providing a nurturing cultural background that will then allow us to integrate those visions uh, and use them to improve our lives and indeed the quality of our society. Okay, let's go to Florida. J.J., first-time caller. Hi, J.J. Yes, sir. Uh, how you guys uh, doing tonight, man? Okay, thanks. Fine, thank you. Just a couple questions for you here, Grant. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm actually a, a big fan. I actually kind of started listening to your work, I want to say, last year in 2008 uh, is when I actually watched one of your uh, things from George Norris show on right. YouTube. I'm not sure what the actual date was. Right. That's when I actually saw it at first, and I thought you were a very interesting guy. But um, and I don't want to offend you when I ask this next question because it's actually not meant to. It's just I don't know. But also, you know, I got your book, Supernatural. It's like a 600-page book, but, you know, it looks like it's going to be good. Um, I'm definitely going to read that. Right. And I also got the 2012 movie you guys just did with uh, Jim Mars and such. So Indeed. Th- those should be good. But, um, you know, as far as I- – I was just wondering, like, um, are you a scientist or are you um, like a layperson? 
<laughs> I'm, a, I'm a human being. I'm a journalist by training. My my objective, uh, my, my my training has taught me to to look into things, to investigate things, to dig up facts. Uh, 